Welcome back, travelers, to the Planeswalker's Tome, your portal to the realms of magic the gathering. Whether you're joining us on YouTube or through our podcast, we're thrilled to have you along for the journey. Before we delve into today's chapter, a quick legal note. While we're diving into the rich lore crafted by Wizards of the Coast, it's important to remember that this is an unofficial audiobook produced with love and respect for the original content. Rest assured, our endeavor is fully compliant with the 2017 Wizards of the Coast fan content policy. Now let us resume our exploration of The Eternal Ice by Jeff Grubb. Chapter 6. Freilies Most of the writings on Freilies come to us from the elves of the southern lands. Findhorn, in particular, which grew in the wreckage of Argoth's shadow. These writings declare her a goddess and speak nothing but praise for her. Not a flower blooms, they say, nor a leaf falls, without her permission. The few human records of this planeswalker are less complimentary, particularly in the light of what happened following the Ice Age. Yet, Freilies was not of elven blood. When she was mortal, but rather human, and several accounts place her as a native of one of the Calgildorian predecessor states. These accounts have been debated, debunked, revived, and revised hundreds of times in the past thousand years so that no one can truly say what the truth of the matter is. However, in one of these great legends, it is said that she went mad as a young planeswalker, as so often happens to the breed, and only the actions of a wizard kept her from becoming a mad, destructive force like Lushrak or Tevesh Sazat. In the serendipity of the Ice Age, that man's name was given as Joda. Arkel, Argivian scholar. Yaya stammered. In her mind, she had envisioned this encounter, in which she would need the aid of a planeswalker. She had received the charm years ago from an ancient druid for services rendered, and never doubted its efficacy. Dozens of times she had considered it, or touched it, or pulled it out, thinking this might be the time it would be used. Only now had she used the chant, sang the song, and besieged the great power to come to her. Freilis had responded. Yaya half expected that she would not, but the goddess had come to her. Yaya had mentally scripted this moment, when she would confront a planeswalker and demand the great being's help. She would be strong-willed. She had thought at the time, strong-willed, keen-minded, and sharp-witted. Now she merrily stammered, her jaw working, but no coherent sounds coming out. For her part, Freilis floated patiently before Yaya, turning slowly in a breeze of her own summoning, surveying the area. The auburn-haired taskmage in her motley furs and robes were still on her knees attempting to gather wits enough to speak. Another human form, dressed in a scholar's robe, sprawled on one of the earthen benches. She seemed disinterested, as if it had seen this shallow cavern before, or one very much like it. Freilis wrinkled her nose, as if noticing a particularly pungent smell. We are near the Shrak, she said. She spoke in two octaves at once. That is enough to spur Yaya to break her silence. One of his minions was here, yes and we are near Trestlehorn, Lim Duel's keep. More of his servants are coming, she replied in a flat tone. This is a safe haven. You should use his magics to escape. We don't, Yaya paused. I don't know how to use those magics. A small matter, said Fairies. There, we are elsewhere. Yaya blinked, and as she did so, she realized that they were elsewhere. The light had shifted slightly, almost subtly, Slowly she rose from her place and walked to the doorway. The shattered snowdrift was gone, replaced by untrammeled drifts that led down to an ice-choked sea. Large shards of ice washed ashore as she watched, piling on top of others from previous waves. Yaya turned and Freilis was watching her again. The planeswalker managed a small smirk. You're supposed to say thank you at this point. Thank you, said Yaya. But walk in my path, child, began Freilis raising a hand for a file of benediction, then stopped. But I didn't call you to save us from limb duel, said Yaya quickly. She could feel her cheeks reddening at the admission, an eyebrow arched. That was Freilie's only visible reaction. You were at the mercy of the Shrak's greatest mortal ally, your hiding place about to be assaulted by a dozen more fiends under the Neckmancer's control. But that was not why you called for my aid? Yaya felt the intensity of the planeswalker's tale. No, I mean, no, ma'am. She felt like a small child in the planeswalker's presence. A pity, said Freilis. You take the aid I provide and say thank you, or you take none at all. Again she raised a hand of benediction. No, wait, 
insisted Yaya, her cheeks flushed now. I called you for a reason. I still... We still need your help. Fraley's lowered her hand again. An amused smile tugging at the corner of her lips. Yaya hated that look. Understood, human child. I am not some summoned shade to do your building. Understand, human child. I am not some summoned shade to do your bidding. I am a planeswalker. You besieged me using the proper charm and the prescribed forms. I appeared and delivered you from danger. You're supposed to prostrate yourself in thanks. Yaya pointed to the form sprawled on the bench and spoke very quickly. Her words ran into each other. That is Joda, the Archmaid's Eternal of Latnam. He is the one who needs your help. Both eyebrows raised now, and Frey Lees drifted over towards Joda's bench. She looked down at the broken form lying there. Joda had scoured his furbs and his robes were wet from sweat. His arms bent in painful positions. His eyes were opened by glassy, and his breathing past spill speck lips were harsh and raspy. Frey Lees looked down at the twisted form and laid a hand against Joda's cheek. Yaya held her breath hoping the touch of a planeswalker would be enough to rouse him, to heal him, to bring him back to normal. Instead, Fraylees tilted her head back and laughed. It was a horrible laugh, like that of a hundred bell towers caught in a hurricane. At last she gathered herself and said, Oh, Joda, how the mighty have finally fallen. The planeswalker ran a hand over Joda's brow. She paused for a moment, as if seeking something in his glassy eyes. This man has been inhaling the pollen of a certain plant from Findhorn, correct? Yaya nodded. I burned it before I escaped from the keep. Foolish, said Ferlis. It has an addictive effect, like the rainbow locust or the wasting drugs of Al Sugul. Foolish, said Ferlis. It has an addictive effect, like the rainbow lotus or the wasting drugs of old Al Sugul. He is purging the poison from his system. The process of that purging may kill him. He is powerful but he cannot use his power in his present state. He is only human. Then you have to help him, said Yaya. Fireleys looked down at the diminutive taskmate with a cold, unblinking stare. Why? she said simply. Yaya cursed. This does not turn out the way she expected. Because the Fireleys whom the elves worship as a goddess would not stand aside and let him die. Human child, said the planeswalker, making the world sound like an insult. The Fireleys whom the elves worship as a god has seen more men and elves and dwarves die in her existence than you have drawn breaths. I have seen cities and tribes and nations die. What matters if one more body is added to the pyre? She looked at Joda's crumpled form. He will survive or he will not. That is the way of Gaia, a force greater than even I. Yaya looked at the planeswalker for a long, somber moment. At last she said, I called you. You owe me. Again the surf sound laughter. And like the jinn of the ring, I must serve you? Because you hold a trinket of mine? Where did you get that bauble anyway? Yaya was silent and Fraley smiled. Hardly the attitude I expect if you want me to help your friend, he taunted. Yaya folded her arms in front of her, looking as defined as possible. Then she took a deep breath and deflated slightly. The elder druid of the Juniper Order, she said, quickly pushing stray hair over her face. In exchange for a service I did for him, and for you he said at the time. Freilis gave a very human snort. Old Colbajorn always was too soft-hearted and too free with my favors. I pulled you from certain death. You'd be a shambling dead thing right now without me. I owe you nothing, human child, and I have no need or desire to bargain with the likes of you. Yaya started to say something vulgar, but caught herself. She looked at Joda. Fine, you owe me nothing, but you do owe him. You know it. Otherwise, you would have zipped out of here as soon as you did your first good deed. The flicker of something Yaya couldn't identify crossed Fraley's face. What do you mean? I mean you owe Joda, said Yaya, for something in your own past. Fraley's again looked down at the sweating form of man, sprawled in the furs. Her face grew stern. Before you can truly ascend, often you must fall, and fall far. What did he reveal to you? Less than you have just revealed yourself, said Yaya trying to keep the smug tone out of her voice. Friley snapped her head up and regarded Yaya harshly. How did you find him? He was captive of Dim Bull, ah, uh, Lim Duel, the necromancer. Lim Duel was using him as a master scholar, and had convinced him he was a summoned creature. I did not ask where, said Freilis. I said how. Yaya spoke slowly. I was at Latnam, at his school, for other matters, and found him missing. No one seemed to know where he went and a few seemed purposely not to care. 
I started looking and found someone who knew someone who knew something. Eventually, the trail led to Trestlehorn. When I got there, he had no knowledge of his past. That has the effect of the pollen, I suppose. In parts, at very least. Let me tell you what the Archmage would not have told you. Every century or so, the pain of immortal life becomes too much, and he chooses to forget, to pull the memories of his past from him. To do so, he lowers his protections, so that he may build still stronger walls. During that time, he goes a little mad. A little madness to offset a greater one. He loses an important part of himself during this time. If someone had him removed from that dam during this period, preventing him from using... The planeswalker was no longer talking to Yaya, but to herself. Yes, I could see how that would be done. Yaya stared, not wanting to irritate the planeswalker any more than she had to. Freyly seemed to remember with the task mage presence. What would you have me do, she asked. Yaya blinked. What do I want you to do, she sputtered. I want you to remove the poison from him. What do you think I want you to do? Freyly leaned forward, towering over the auburn-haired woman. Are you quite sure? Yaya noticed a smile pull up at the corner of the planeswalker's mouth. Of course, said Yaya. Suspicion already creeping into her voice. Freyly's willingness to help was in many ways scarier than her refusal. Very well, then let me begin, said the planeswalker. She spread her hands above the twisted body, fingers sprayed. Freyly's closed her eyes and Yaya could imagine a great being forcing her own will through her hands. Working magic and mana at such a refined level that Yaya's own spells looked like sharpened sticks and blocks of stone. Which, thought Yaya, they probably were to someone like Freyli's. With agonizing slowness, a trickle of yellow gash began to stream from Joda's nostrils. A spittle-flecked mouth. The gas, a vapor made of suspended bits of pollen, drifted upwards, collecting in a huge ball over their heads, before finally dissipating. Beneath Freya's hands, Joda began to twist and moan, more frenetic than before. It was cold where Joda was, and he hated that cold. The air was chill, and he shivered in his sweat-stained tunic and pants. He had been running. That much he knew. But from where? And toward what? He had no idea. He was in a great house, or rather a collection of houses, each one shifting into one another as he moved down the hallways. It was a ramshackle palace, built over several millennia, and the architecture reflected it. Simple wooden floorboards gave way to ornate parakeet laid with inset gemstones that in turn transformed to dark granite blocks, each laid perfectly without need of mortar. Similarly, the walls changed from plaster to lathe to oppressive stonework to rough cavern walls. The halls were lit by torches, by small glowing beetles and by shards of crystal bulbs carved in the shape of small bonfires. There were ornate tapestries and paintings, and alcoves containing stationary dotted halls. But each time Jonah sought to pay attention to them, they twisted and shifted in place, denying him any clue as to their true nature. There were windows as well, and Jonah thought he knew what should lie beyond. This one should have looked out to an old tower in a cranberry bog. That one should have had a view of a great bay, ringed by a city built into a rocky cliff of outcroppings. Still another should have surveyed the ruins of a great castle, a set of ruins that he knew he could help create. Yet beyond the windows was only darkness, and in that darkness, the huge helping shapes moved, whispering things in language that Joda was certain he knew, but could not understand. The windows filled Joda with fear, and he fled from them, but the doors filled him with rage and frustration. There were all matters of design, rustic wooden doors, glyph-carved gates made of dark stone, double doors, circular portals, and arches covered with runes. All the doors were closed and locked. The knockers, in the shape of griffins, dragons, and faces that Joda thought he should know, did not bring any answer. And the doorknobs, made of onyx, jade, and malachite, were inert to his touch. He knew he needed a key, but he did not know where the key was. So he began to run, but running did no good. The doors remained shut. The windows remained full of ebon shadows, and the tapestries remained impenetrable. He ran until he could no longer recognize the architecture, and he began trying doors again until he felt the frustration grow once more, and felt the need to run again. How long had he been doing this? He could not tell, and he felt his entire life had been no more than a combination of flight 
and desperate attempts at opening doors. He could not remember what was behind the doors, which was even more maddening, for he was convinced that he himself put whatever it was there. Then Joda stopped in the middle of a great hall, ringed with locked doors of different designs. He heard something. First came the wind. It was a spiraling cascade of billowing air, blowing away the dust and grime in its path, sliding its way through the maze-like corridors of the Phantom Citadel. It was a familiar wind to Joda as well. It was not a comfortable type of familiar. It was a wind that carried power and menace. Still, in the great hall of doorways, he held his ground. Next came a sound that he thought was the marching of steel-clad feet. They were precise and sharp, and growing louder. Then Joda realized it was not the marching feet at all, but rather locks, snapping open and in a rough, unrelenting precision. All the doors that he had passed were unlocking, and the things that were behind them were trying to get out. The doors on all sides of him now began to snap open, shuddling as their deadboards slid away from their notches. He could hear the rustling mechanisms complain as the knobs on the far side twisted under his unseen hands. He could hear the hideous squeak and snap under assault of the things that were now shouldering them open. The doors were flung open all at once, outward into his halls, and the things they held back began to shamble and slither and scrape outwards. Joda knew them. Knew each of them, but could not describe them. No. To describe them was to admit them, and give them mass and existence, and being to give them power. That was what they wanted from him, what they called to him in a thousand voices. They wanted his power. They wanted his existence. They wanted his eternal life. They were things that were wrapped in the fog, trapped in the ice in the back of his mind, and now they were free. Joda began to run, screaming as he fled the hallway. Ahead of him he heard the winds and snapping open of a thousand of other locks. The cavern that had been an earlier part of the mountain and was now part of the rime-covered shore. Joda's eyes flew open. His mouth gaped wide and he screamed loud, hard, and ragged, as all the air went out of him. He took a deep, rasping breath and screamed again. Yaya shouted, What did you do to him? Freilis looked at the taskmate dispassionately. I did what you asked. I pulled the power from the system, and in doing so, I paid off an old debt I have long owed him. But why? Yaya bellowed over Joda's water cries. Why is he still screaming? Freilis raised an eyebrow. Were you not listening? The Archmage Eternal regularly needs to tuck away his memories, his regrets, his human foibles. He is no planeswalker. He cannot do it without going mad. So he strips down his defenses and packs away his memories like old souvenirs in an attic trunk. Whoever sent Joda into Dim Duel's clutches did so when he was still in the process of rebuilding his defenses. Lim Duel used the addictive pollen to keep Joda's unbridled memories hidden. Subtle, particularly for him. It was the only thing keeping Joda from feeling over two millennia of pain, emotion, and memories. In doing what you asked, I pulled the protection from him. He is feeling his memories, his emotions, all of them, all at once. Yaya's eyes widened and she cursed. You knew, she spat for your eyes. I suspected, replied the planeswalker, but I did as you asked. I granted your heartfelt wish. Now your archmage will live but his mind may not be able to take the strain that his body has been able to take the strength of the toxin. Yaya felt as if the air had been driven from her lungs, as if the blood had been drained from her brain. There was something she should do. After all, this was her fault. She stammered and said, You knew he had done this before. Freilis nodded, ignoring the screaming man. I was one of the few he trusted with such knowledge, regardless of what else he thought of me. Then you know how he kept his sanity before? asked Yaya. Freilis tilted her head to one side, and it seemed to Yaya that the planeswalker enjoyed the screams. He used a particular advice to center himself in such times. It is a simple though unique thing that had made previous times much less painful than this one. Tell me quickly, said Yaya. Where is this simple thing? Can you get it? Freilis smiled, and it was an ugly, hate-filled smile. Why should I do this? Do you worship me? Do you venerate my name? Do you even serve my people? You are a little wizard of gold coins and simple spells. You are a trinket cousin from a soft-hearted human, and assume that I'll be at your beck and call, your personal genie. I have discharged my responsibility to the trinket, and thanks to you, she nodded towards a pounded-eyed form of Joda, I have discharged my obligation to the archmaid as well. Tell me, why should I help you now? Yaya folded her arms again, and shoved the sound of Joda's hoarse shouts from her mind. Because then I will owe you something. 
Anything in particular? smirked Frailes, raising a finger to her lips in an ancient croquet. Ah, uh, I... I don't know. But I will owe you. And so will he. Ah, said Frailes, folding her legs up beneath her so she flowed to the, in the cavern. Ah, said Frailes, folding her legs up beneath her so she flowed there in the cavern. A nasty smile appeared on her face. Then that's different, isn't it? said the planeswalker. Let's bargain then, shall we, human child? This concludes chapter 6 of our saga. If you enjoy the tale so far, don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us on both YouTube and your preferred podcast platform. Your support means the world to us. Until next time, may your adventures be as boundless as the plains themselves. Thank you for listening.